This is St. Louis on the Air from St. Louis Public Radio. I'm Elaine Cha. If you're anything like me, you've spent the last few days of single-digit temperatures eating warm food and thinking about all the things I could be doing outside if outside didn't feel like a bath of ice cubes and razor blades put together. As it turns out, though, the latest issue of Sauce magazine had perfect timing. In just a bit, we'll meet a chocolatier who's making waves with bean-to-bar chocolate. But first... We're going to talk winter soups. It's definitely the right season, and here to talk about some of her favorite soups is Ileana Martinez, writer for Sauce Magazine. Ileana, welcome to St. Louis on the Air. Hey, thanks for having me, Elaine. Now, Ileana, before we get into your picks, can you just tell us generally what makes a good winter soup for you? What makes a good winter soup for me? Well, it's the same thing that makes any soup good for me any time of year. Um, I'm a big soup girl. Okay. But for me, I think winter soups, um, I prefer them to be very vegetable forward. Um, I just feel like they're more nutritious. And especially during this time of year where I can't go out to the grocery store, I end up just forcing myself to make use of all the vegetables that I have in the fridge that I haven't been using and putting that together into a kind of Frankenstein stew, if you will, that's really satisfying and comforting for this time of year. Mm -hmm. So that's my preference. Okay. Well, let's get to the soups and the the stews. You highlighted a classic in the piece that you wrote for Sauce, and that is chicken soup at Merendero La... I'm going to get this right. Merendero Las Catrachitas. Tell us about that. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, great job. Um, So about that soup... Uh, Part of why I included it is that it partly represents my background. So my mom is from El Salvador and Merendero is a Honduran restaurant. It's not from El Salvador, but it's a country that's right next door. A lot of the food uh, overlaps um, and kind of speaks to general Central American cuisine. So I wanted to highlight a restaurant that has made me feel more at home in St. Louis. I was seeking food that reminded me of my upbringing and even though I didn't find, I didn't immediately find a Salvadorian restaurant, I found a Honduran restaurant that had some of the same foods that I ate growing up. So the food there uh, has some classics from Honduras, from from El Salvador, and the soup in the article um, is vegetable forward like I was just talking about. It's very Mm -hmm. simple, just has carrots, potatoes, and really tender uh, chicken legs that are falling off the bone. And it looks so simple, but it just feels really satisfying and like a big warm hug when you when you dig into it. Mm-hmm. Now, another soup that you wrote about is a, a stew, and it's at the Korean restaurant Juju. And it's a page menu, a one page full uh, menu of soups. And you picked out so I'm pronouncing mm-hmm. it the way that Koreans would. I don't know how others uh, would do that. Why is it that you chose this particular dish? Well, I lo- I'm a big fan of a lot of the different stews that come out of Korean cuisine. Um, Dinjang Jjigae in particular uh, kind of favors my palate because I tend to like funkier foods, mm-hmm. for lack of a better term. I like exploring all the fermented things that come out of global cuisines. And, you know, I was originally familiar with miso in Japan, and then I learned about denjang paste in Korea, and just the kind of pungent, funky aroma that comes out of that stew just really suits me. And uh, that restaurant in particular puts a lot of seafood in it, which I also appreciate. Um, they really... Uh, they're very generous with the tofu and seafood that they put in the soup. And I, I just think uh, the experience of watching it come out still boiling and still cooking in front of you is something that's unique to Korean restaurants as well. Mm-hmm. And it's definitely a, a stew to be slurped because of that heat. Mm-hmm. Now, of the other soups that you chose, was there a one that was completely new to you and that surprised you a little bit? One that was completely new to me was the 
Yahnia, I believe I'm pronouncing that correctly, uh, from Taste of Bosnia. Mm -hmm. I knew I wanted to touch on Bosnian food because if I'm doing an exploration of world cuisines for a St. Louis magazine, I felt that I would be remiss uh, without talking about Bosnian food Mm -hmm. and highlighting St. Louis's Bosnian community. But I had never had Bosnian food outside of the grilled meats that you can find speckled throughout Bivo Mill. So I wanted to highlight a a stew from that region. I'd never had stew with a side of fluffy mashed potatoes before, but (laughs) it was really comforting. And I just appreciated the simplicity of the dish. And I was happy that I was able to kind of branch outside of what I was more familiar with. Mm -hmm. Our producer, Danny Wisentowski, had said he gasped aloud uh, when he read your description of the the mashed potatoes in particular. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And then there's another soup that comes out of House of Jollof. And this is a a soup that not everyone will be able to eat because of allergies. But tell us about this soup. Yeah, so the soup from House of Jollof was the peanut stew. Um, And again, I just made this article about uh, flavors that suit my palate. I wanted to make it a little bit about my story, but of course helpful to a lot of other people. And I love peanuts and peanut butter and um, like making desserts that are peanut centric. But this was the first time that I'd learned about an entree or a soup where the dominant flavor was peanut. So this uh, peanut stew or groundnut stew from House of Yalef is light and a little sweet but also creamy from the peanut that's mixed in with it and it's just it's really special i can't think of other uh soups where it's where it's such a nutty and peanut forward flavor Mm -hmm. i wanted to highlight that because um also again bringing it close to home i had a good friend in college who is whose family was from ghana uh, and that was where i first learned about the dish okay and then it is also it's a vegan offering Um, that also gives you the choice of three spice levels. Yes. Yeah, you can make it vegan. Uh, I got it. I think I got mine with chicken. And there is a choice of chicken, uh, goat, beef, but you could go and make it vegan. And I tried to go um, as spicy as I could just because that's my preference, but they do give that flexibility. Okay, and that sounds just right for this winter weather. The, the other one that you talked about is a southern uh, beloved dish, and it was at Hudat Southern Food Bar and Grill, and that's a gumbo. Ileana, tell us about this gumbo and what made it stand out so much that you included it in your piece. Yeah, so gumbo, I wanted to uh, kind of bring it back home uh, with, this, with this stew. Uh, there was... An earlier version of the article that was kind of told from the perspective of someone flying around the world, right? So we made it around the world and now we're back in the States. And what classic dish or stew from the States did I want to highlight? So um, I, I moved here from Houston. I have fond memories of taking road trips to New Orleans. So that city is is close to my heart. And gumbo is just another one that is... Um, It's so filling because, you know, it's made with the roux, right? So it feels very, you feel sated at the end of a a good cup of gumbo, right? And you have carbs from the rice and you have a lot of different types of meats that go in, you know, like your andouille sausage or some have seafood. Okra is another one of my favorite vegetables. So I think gumbo encompasses not only good memories for me, but just some of my favorite ingredients. Well, we'll be looking forward to trying some of these and experiencing what you did. Ileana Martinez is a writer for Sauce Magazine. Her latest piece is titled Five Soups from Around the World to Try in St. Louis This Winter. Ileana, thank you for being with us. Of course, thank you. Now, let's shift gears a bit from soups to sweets. Chocolatier Flynn Edgerton is also featured in this month's Sauce magazine, and he's on its list of ones to watch. Flynn is a wholesale production manager at Sump Coffee, and he's with me now. Flynn, welcome to St. Louis on the Air. Thanks for having me. So, Flynn, Sump Coffee did not start making chocolate until just last year, 2023, And that's because of you. 
How is it that you wound up at Sump? So I had spent a number of years prior working as a chocolate maker uh, and had been looking to bridge the gap into the world of coffee. Um, and the position opened at Sump just at the right time as I was kind of uh, sitting around, <laughs> kind of job hunting, spending a lot of time on Indeed and saw the posting, reached out. Uh, they contacted me pretty quickly and uh, in the interview process, I learned that Sump Coffee had originally been in, uh, incorporated or uh, the LLC was originally filed under Sump Coffee and Chocolate. And up until that point, they had never uh, brought a consistent product to market. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it felt like this serendipitous moment, uh, kind of meeting of worlds. And what is it about chocolate and market that is so so challenging? So it's not only an expensive raw product, uh, it's also very labor intensive. Um, your typical window of production for a batch of chocolate is between 48 and 96 hours sometimes. Oh, wow. Um, depending on the amount that you're refining and uh, how long it takes to temper through that. So yeah, it can, it can take a while. It costs a lot of money. Um, yeah, it, it. Yeah, and then there's no guarantee that people are going to pick it up. Correct. Right. Yeah, St. Louis is um, kind of new to the idea of specialty chocolate, mm -hmm. so it's it's much more prevalent on the coasts. Uh, a yeah. lot in New York, a lot in San Francisco, Seattle, places like that. Mm -hmm. uh, but the Midwest is kind of uncharted territory for mm -hmm. uh, specialty chocolate. There are a few companies like uh, Patrick, uh, Askinosi. Uh, companies like that that have been around for a long time and have been doing this sort of thing for a long time. But uh, St. Louis is a small market. Uh, we're one of just a few companies who are doing something like this right mm -hmm. now. And what is it that goes into the chocolate, Flynn, that you're making at Sump? Ingredient-wise? Yeah. It's two ingredients. So it's the raw product that we roast um, – mill and refine and sugar. So it's it's just cacao and sugar. Okay. And how typical is that? Do a lot of places add many other ingredients? If we're talking about um, like popular uh, chocolates that everyone knows, if we're talking about Hershey's or something like that, uh, only about 20% of the actual finished product is cacao. Mm -hmm. um, typically, there are additives, emulsifiers, flavor modifiers, things like that that go into a chocolate that uh, make it more uniform, uh, change the way it presents on your palate from a texture perspective. Uh, there, are, there are lots of things that go into it. Yeah. Now, the piece in Sauce describes what you're doing as bean to bar. What does that mean? Yes. So that is the idea of taking the raw product. Uh, we receive 55 to 70 kilogram sacks of dried fermented cacao. It is a raw product. Uh, so we start from the raw product, uh, roast, winnow, refine, uh, sweeten, and temper. So all the way through the process from raw product to finished product, we do it all. And it's all done in-house as far as the creation of the chocolate itself. Yes, absolutely. And you're doing that on your own? <laughs> Primarily, yeah. Okay. So, I mean, you said earlier, it takes a lot of work to make the chocolate. And you're often at the shop uh, before the owner is. So what is a, a day in the life like for, for Flynn, the chocolatier? <laughs> <laughs> um, so... Uh, a, a little sidebar, um, a chocolatier is a confectioner. I always like to make the distinction. I'm a chocolate maker. Um, it's it's kind of like the engineer versus the artist, right? You build from raw materials, and then those raw materials can be turned into whatever they want by the artist. I see. Okay. Um, but my typical day is uh, coffee first. So my primary position uh, is... Um, working in fulfillment at Sump. So uh, every bit of coffee that we send out around the country uh, comes from my office. And uh, that takes up a bulk of my time. But um, on any given day, I probably get into the shop between 7.30 and 9 a.m. Um, 
check emails, <laughs> check orders, uh, do the do the sort of uh, normal fulfillment tasks that I do every day. Uh, and I'll follow that, uh, and with any free time I have, I'll spend that upstairs working with chocolate. Mm-hmm. Now, Sauce Magazine's Heather Huff, uh, Hughes Huff, she wrote about your work um, in a very particular way. She described how you have excelled. Um, in part, it's due to your being a, a realist and pragmatic when it comes to chocolate. I mean. How does that read to you? What does that mean? So uh, it's it's kind of about finding uh, the balance between uh, passion for what you're doing and a realistic outlook in terms of uh, its viability as a product in a market and uh, the reality of the fact that it's a specialty product, it's an expensive product, and it, it requires a niche market. Um, I, I know from experience um, in a previous role that – uh, running a chocolate company that is solely a chocolate company is very much an uphill battle um, between, like I spoke about, the cost of the raw product and the other ingredients involved and the labor and time required to make a finished product. Um, and there are things that you don't think about as well, like packaging, um, just all of the logistical parts of something that is, uh, by and large, a passion product. Um so I think being pragmatic and being realistic is a way to uh, temper my expectations, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so last question here. You, you Pragmatic, you're, it's about the, the head. But obviously, you know, chocolate is something that you enjoy with other senses. So when you bite into a chocolate, what makes it good to you? <sighs> That's... Uh... It's a, it's a loaded question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, for me, there are there's the objective qualities that you look for in a chocolate in terms of mouthfeel, uh, how smooth it is, um, if it if it melts well on the palate but doesn't melt in your hands quickly, uh, things that speak to the quality of the uh, chocolate production, but. Uh, when it comes to flavor, it's for me. It's it's all about expression of what the cacao has to offer. It's a product very much like coffee that is. Um, it, it responds to weather patterns. It responds to uh, other crops that are grown in the same region, uh, soil quality and health. Um, all sorts of things go into the way the raw product presents itself flavor-wise. And I don't think a lot of people realize how fruity cacao is. Mm -hmm. Uh, In the same way as coffee, it is essentially the seed of a fruit. So if it's it's treated well and treated like a specialty product, you get a lot of those fruity characteristics out of it. Mm -hmm. So I like to look for, um, you know, still big traditional fudgy chocolatey notes, But I love to see expressions of fruit, uh, nuts, spice, all number of things that might go into it. Mm -hmm. And that sounds great, actually, for a day as cold as this. Yes. Yeah. (laughs) Flynn Edgerton is a chocolate maker at Sump Coffee and one of Sauce Magazine's one to watch in the St. Louis food scene. Flynn, thank you for coming in today. Oh, yeah. Thank you for having me. And earlier, we talked about Winter Soups with Sauce Magazine writer Ileana Martinez. You can read all about Flynn's chocolates and soup picks from Ileana Martinez in this month's Sauce Magazine. This episode was produced by Danny Wissentowski. Audio engineering and podcast design by Aaron Dorr. Our executive producer is Alex Hoyer. St. Louis on the Air is a production of St. Louis Public Radio. Understanding starts here. St. Louis on the Air proudly supports local artists by using music from Life Creative Group. Do you find yourself regularly listening to episodes of St. Louis on the Air? Suggest us to a friend you think might enjoy our conversations. And leave us a review and rating on Apple Podcasts on the App Store. It's the simplest way to help people discover our show. Thank you. St. Louis Public Radio is a member-supported service of the University of Missouri-St. Louis.
Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, providing more than 41,000 jobs in the production of wood pallets, railroad ties, white oak barrels, hardwood floors, and more. Details at ChooseWood.com.